What if I told you that a sickly farm kid from Ohio, who couldn't handle basic chores without getting migraines, would single-handedly force the entire automotive industry to abandon a technology that had killed and maimed thousands of people? The same man who convinced General Motors to bet everything on diesel technology when their own executives thought he was completely insane. A gamble that would eventually power the locomotives and heavy machinery that built modern America. This is the fascinating story of Charles Kettering, the dreamer who rewired a nation. Charles Kettering did not look like the kind of man who would change anything. Born in 1876 on a small farm in Loudonville, Ohio, he spent most of his childhood trying to manage chronic migraines and weak eyesight while his brothers handled the heavy work. His teachers assumed he would never amount to much. His neighbors assumed he would end up repairing wagons or selling hardware. Even Kettering thought his body might limit whatever future he hoped to build, but he had one thing that kept him from blending in with everyone around him. He could not leave broken objects alone. Clocks, lanterns, barn machinery, telegraph parts, anything with gears or wires. He wanted to understand why things failed and why people accepted those failures as normal. That curiosity mattered far more than physical strength, and it pulled him away from farm life the moment he was old enough to leave. After high school, he taught for a short time just to save money, then worked his way into an engineering program at Ohio State. His eyesight was so bad he had to drop out temporarily, but he refused to quit. When he returned, he still struggled to read technical drawings, so he kept most of his designs in his head instead of on paper. It forced him to work slower than others, but it also made him better at visualizing electrical systems. His first real job was at the National Cash Register Company, and that's where people finally realized he wasn't a hobbyist. He developed reliable electric motors and control systems for NCR's registers, transforming them from hand crank machines into efficient electrical systems, quickly outpacing older veterans who viewed him as a fragile newcomer. By the time he left NCR, he had earned a reputation as the one man who could make new electrical ideas work when others gave up. This reputation would push him toward a challenge that no one else wanted to touch and it would set the stage for the invention that put the entire American automobile industry on notice. Kettering walked away from NCR with a small group of colleagues and an idea that sounded reckless even to his friends. He wanted to build a company devoted entirely to solving electrical problems for the growing automobile industry. Most early cars barely had reliable wiring, let alone complex systems. But Kettering believed electricity was the only way to make cars safer and easier to use, and he refused to let the limits of the day slow him down. The danger of hand cranking a car was enormous and every driver knew it. A backfire could rip the crank from your grip and break your wrist or arm in an instant. Men lost fingers and shoulders to the kickback. Women were discouraged from driving at all because the physical force required to crank an engine was considered too much. When Kettering looked at that problem, he didn't see an inconvenience. He saw a disaster waiting for a solution. He believed he could replace the crank with an electric motor, but the technology didn't exist yet in any usable form. Batteries were weak, wiring was unreliable, motors were too fragile, none of this bothered him. He built prototype after prototype in the cramped upstairs lab at the newly formed Dayton Engineering Laboratories company. Fires were common. Kettering nearly burned himself trying to manage overheating coils and short circuits. His eyesight made testing even more dangerous. He often worked until past midnight, building and rebuilding parts by hand because machinists refused to make components they were sure would fail. His break came when Cadillac reached out about creating a safer way to start their engines. Cadillac had money and influence. If he could impress them, the entire industry would notice. Kettering promised he could deliver a working electric starter in a matter of months, even though he knew the deadline was brutal. The first test motor barely turned over. The second one seized before reaching full rotation. The third one finally produced enough torque to crank an engine, but the wiring overheated so badly that the insulation smoldered. He kept refining it. Stronger windings, better brushes, more reliable contacts. When he tested the fourth major design on a Cadillac in late 1911, the engine started cleanly with a single press of a switch. Cadillac adopted the system immediately for the 1912 Model 30, making it the first production car with an electric starter. The electric starter changed everything. For the first time, anyone could start a car without fear or strength. 
That single invention pushed the American automobile from a niche machine into a true mass market product and made Kettering impossible for anyone in Detroit to ignore. His electric starter pushed the entire industry toward electrical systems, and suddenly everyone needed generators, ignition improvements, and better wiring. General Motors had just survived a chaotic period of mergers and internal fights, and the company knew it needed a research division capable of shaping the future. They wanted someone who could think past the next model year. Kettering was the obvious choice, even if bringing him in meant trouble for the people who liked the old way of doing things. By the time Kettering formally took the helm of GM research in 1920, his reputation was already solidified. His electric starter had done more than just prevent broken arms. It had rendered the dangerous hand crank obsolete, setting a new industry standard that would eventually open the world of driving to a much wider public. The carburetor and crank method had worked well enough, and there was no reason to invite complexity into already temperamental machines. Kettering ignored the complaints. He believed electricity would control every important function of a vehicle if someone had the patience to make it reliable. GM didn't hire him to improve the present. They hired him to invent the future. He built GM Research as an independent group, cut off from the day-to-day -day manufacturing lines so he could explore ideas without managers shutting them down. That independence created enemies almost immediately. Some executives felt he spent too much money on experiments that had no clear payoff. Others worried that his projects would force expensive redesigns across multiple GM brands. Kettering didn't care. His job was to stay ahead, not to stay popular. Among the ideas he championed most was the development of efficient, high-speed diesel engines, a field he believed could redefine heavy transportation. Most American engineers still saw diesels as slow, stationary workhorses meant for factories or ships. The idea of a diesel engine suitable for transportation seemed unrealistic. They were noisy, shook themselves apart at high RPMs, and weighed far more than gasoline engines delivering the same output. But Kettering saw something everyone else overlooked. Diesel efficiency. He understood that if someone could build a light, durable diesel capable of sustained high speed, it would outperform gasoline engines in every heavy-use setting. He began quietly pushing GM to explore diesel research even when others dismissed it. That interest pulled him toward a small Cleveland company already experimenting with transportation diesels. Their engines were hit or miss, often literally, but they were trying things no one else dared attempt. And despite their failures, Kettering believed they held the key to the future he imagined. That company was the Winton Engine Company, and they were about to give him the biggest challenge of his career. Winton was already struggling by the time Kettering turned his attention to them. Their early diesel engines worked well enough in power plants and stationary jobs, but the move into transportation exposed every weakness in the design. The engines vibrated themselves apart at higher speeds, suffered constant lubrication failures, and ran hot enough to warp components that were never meant to handle that kind of stress. Railroad executives tolerated a few breakdowns, but the patients wore thin when locomotives stalled on test runs and stranded trains in full view of the public. GM had quietly invested in Winton, and every failure made them look reckless. After GM invested in Winton, they attempted to adapt the company's existing four-cycle designs for the rails, but the results were catastrophic. The engines were too heavy to be efficient and too weak to be useful. Kettering pushed his team toward a radical, two-stroke design, the experimental Model 201, hoping to achieve the power-to-weight ratio of a gasoline engine. But the prototypes were nightmares. They burned through bearings, cracked heads, and warped exhaust valves. Test crews found themselves draining oil contaminated with metal shavings after shockingly low hours of operation. The new design was powerful, but it was self-destructing. Inside GM, the mood shifted from curiosity to frustration. Executives questioned why they were wasting time on a project that seemed doomed from the start. Some argued that the entire diesel experiment should be abandoned before it buried more money. Others pushed to distance GM from Winton to protect the company's reputation. Kettering saw the same failures but read them differently. He believed the 201 wasn't proof that high-speed diesels were impossible. It was proof that Winton lacked the resources and research discipline to refine the idea. In his mind, the failures were not a verdict. They were a roadmap showing exactly what needed to be fixed.
The breaking point came when a series of engines failed in quick succession during railroad demonstrations. GM leadership prepared to cut ties and write off the losses. Kettering refused. He argued that GM could not walk away from a technology that could eventually dominate heavy transportation. The idea sounded bold to some and foolish to others. Buying Winton outright would mean taking full responsibility for the ongoing disasters. It also meant trusting Kettering enough to let him rebuild the diesel program from the ground up. Against strong internal opposition, GM completed its full purchase of Winton in 1930, taking direct control of the troubled engine maker. To many executives, it felt like throwing good money after bad. To Kettering, it was the only way forward. He isolated the diesel project within GM research, brought in new engineers, and began dissecting every weakness in the 201. His team pulled engines apart, documented failure modes, and applied the kind of long-term research discipline Winton never had. They improved lubrication paths, redesigned cooling, strengthened components, and used every disaster as a data point. The work was slow and expensive, but it changed everything. Instead of abandoning high-speed diesels, GM was finally learning how to build them. Those lessons would feed directly into the next generation of engines and eventually into the power plants that reshaped American railroads. The eventual result was the Model 201A, the engine that powered the famous Burlington Zephyr and captured the nation's imagination. But while the public saw a miracle, Kettering knew the truth. The 201A was a laboratory watch, brilliant but too delicate for the brutal grind of daily freight. It required constant nursing by onboard mechanics just to finish a run. GM research had to be relentless. They took the lessons from the fragile Zephyr engine and began designing a rugged successor from scratch. They tested new alloys, redesigned oil passages, and strengthened the crankcase to handle abuse that would have shattered the earlier models. Inside GM, skepticism faded only when the diesel tests began showing signs of stability at speeds that would have destroyed earlier engines. Railroad engineers noticed the difference first. They were used to seeing the prototypes wheeled back to the shop after short runs, but now the engines were holding together longer during trials. Those incremental improvements made GM consider something they had never entertained seriously before. If they could redesign the diesel from the ground up instead of patching Winton's problems, they might build an engine that could survive continuous service. That shift in thinking created the environment that led to the next generation of designs. Once GM brought both Winton and the Electromotive Corporation under its control in 1930, engineers from all three groups began working as a unified team, sharing test data and redesign proposals. They weren't chasing minor gains anymore. They were building an entirely new engine architecture that would solve the structural, cooling, and lubrication issues permanently. The early concepts that came out of that collaboration were the first steps toward the engine families that would later dominate American railroads. The real breakthrough was the realization that railroad diesels needed to be modular, easy to service, and standardized. Instead of treating each engine as a unique project, GM focused on creating a platform that could be scaled, repaired, and produced consistently. The design philosophy that emerged from that thinking shaped the engines that followed and became one of GM's most effective advantages. Kettering saw those changes happening and understood what they meant. GM wasn't just fixing an unreliable engine. They were building the foundation for a transportation shift that had seemed impossible only a few years earlier. The diesel program he fought to protect was maturing into something stable and repeatable, something that could finally handle the demands that had crushed the early prototypes. And the work continued, each improvement pushing the engines closer to the reliability needed to challenge the dominance of steam. The momentum inside GM changed once the diesel program finally showed it could survive hard use. The engineering teams no longer spent their days patching failures. They were free to design for strength instead of damage control. Cylinders became easier to service. Cooling passages were widened and reshaped to move heat where it needed to go. Lubrication systems were redesigned to keep bearings alive under loads that would have destroyed the early engines. The focus shifted from simply getting a diesel to run to making it dependable under real railroad schedules, with crews who didn't care how delicate the machinery used to be. Those improvements gave Electromotive something they had never possessed before, 
an engine that could be built in volume and maintained without exotic parts or specialized knowledge. Railroads that had doubted high-speed diesels began asking for extended demonstrations. They wanted to see how long the engines would hold up under switching duty, mounting grades, freezing nights, and long-haul traffic. The tests weren't flawless, but they didn't need to be. What mattered was that the engines stayed together and delivered predictable performance. That consistency opened the door for broader production. GM responded by expanding research, manufacturing, and field support around a unified design philosophy. Instead of letting each model evolve independently, they built a system where parts, procedures, and service routines stayed consistent across variations. The new engines shared core architecture, which made them easier to learn and cheaper to build. Railroad mechanics who once treated diesel engines as experimental machines now recognized them as dependable tools that could replace steam without a complicated learning curve. Kettering never claimed to be the architect of every detail. His strength was understanding how research, manufacturing, and field testing had to work together to make high-speed diesels viable. He pushed GM to commit resources when the numbers looked terrible. He forced them to think about reliability the same way they thought about volume production, and he kept the diesel program alive long enough for the engineering teams to turn their data into something stable. When the new engines entered service, they didn't just replace steam, they changed how railroads scheduled trains, managed fuel, and planned maintenance. The difference was so dramatic that companies rewrote operating procedures to take advantage of the new capabilities. Those changes echoed far beyond the rail yards and into factories, ports, and the broader transportation network that relied on dependable power. The research that Kettering fought to protect was now driving the engines that reshaped American industry.